जन बाला बागी बरधारी यशोदनंदन प्रजजन रंजन यशोदनंदन प्रजजन रंजन यमुना थीरा वनचारी यमुना थीरा वनचारी हरे कृष्णा हरे कृष्णा 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 हरे 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 रामो हरे रामो राम राम हरे हरे जय जय प्रभु पाद प्रभु पाद प्रभु पाद जय जय प्रभु पाद प्रेमानंदे हरिबो नम ओम विष्णु पदाय कृष्ण प्रेस्ताय भूतले श्रीमती भक्ति वेदांत स्वामी नमने नमस्ते सरस्वती देवी गौरवाणी प्रचारिणे निर्विशेष शून्यवादी पश्चच देश तारिणे ओम नमो भगवते वसुदेवाय ओम नमो भगवते वसुदेवाय ओम नमो भगवते वसुदेवाय नारायण नमस्कृत नरम चरोतम दैवी सरस्वती व्यास तथो जय मुधिरायत नस्तप्रयेशु भद्रेशु निगवत सेवाया भगवती उत्तम श्लोके भक्ति नैष्टिकी रीडिंग श्रीमद भागवतम कैंटो फाइव चैप्टर वन एंटाइटो द एक्टिविटीज ऑफ महाराज प्रिया व्रता टेक्स नंबर फोर्टी वन बोम मनुषम चाहिव कर्मयोगज यश्चक्रे निपुषाजन प्रिया भूम दिव्य मनुष्य महिव कर्मयोगज यश्चक्रे नरयोपम्यम पुषा नुजना प्रिया 
Bomam Deviam Manusham Cha Mahitvam Karma Yoga Jam Yes Chakre Nirya Yopamyam Purushanu Jana Priyaha Bomam Deviam Manusham Cha Mahitvam Karma Yoga Jam Yes Chakre Niryan Upamyam Purushanu Jana Priya the lower planets, Devyam, heavenly, Manusham, of human beings, Cha, also, Mahitvam, all opulences, Karma, by fruit of activities, Yoga, by mystic power, Jam, born, ya, one who, chakre, did, niraya, with hell, opamyam, comparison, or equality, purusha, of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Anujana to the devotee, Priya, most dear. Translation As a great follower and devotee of the sage Narada, Maharaj Priyavrat considered hellish the opulences he had achieved by dint of fruitive activities and mystic power whether in the lower or heavenly planetary system or in human society. You can repeat, as a great follower and devotee of the sage Narad, Maharaj Priyavrata 
considered hellish the opulences he had achieved by dint of fruitive activities and mystic power whether in the lower or heavenly planetary system or in human society purport by Srila Prabhupada. Srila Rupa Goswami has said that the position of a devotee is so super excellent that a devotee does not consider any material opulence worth having. There are different types of opulences on earth, in the heavenly planets and even in the lower planetary systems known as Patala. A devotee, however, knows that they are all material and, and consequently he is not at all interested in them. As stated in Bhagavad Gita, Paramdrasva Nivartate, sometimes yogis and jnanis voluntarily give up all material opulences to practice their system of liberation and, and taste spiritual bliss. However, they frequently fall down because artificial renunciation of material opulences cannot endure. One must have a superior taste in spiritual life, then he can give up material opulence. Maharaj Priyavrat had already tasted spiritual bliss and therefore he had no interest in any of the material achievements available on the lower, higher or middle planetary systems. Thus end the Bhaktivedanta purports of the fifth canto first chapter of Srimad Bhagavatam entitled the activities of Maharaj Priyavrat. O Magyana Tamaranda Syagyananjana Shalakaya Chaksur Unmilitanyena Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha Shri Chaitanya Mano Bistam Stapitam Yena Bhutale Swayam Rupa Kadamayam Dadati Swapadantikam Bandeham Shri Guru Shri Yata Padakamalam Shri Gurun Vaishnavamscha Shri Rupam Sagrajatam Sahagana Raganathan Vitam Tam Sajevam Sadvayatam Savadutam Parijana Sahitam Krishna Chaitanya Devam Shri Radha Krishna Padan Sahagana Lalita Shri Vishaka Nitamscha. He Krishna Karana Sindhu Dina Bandhu Jagatpate Gopesha Gopika Kanta Radha Kanta Namastate Tapta Kanchana Gorange Radhe Vrindavanishwari Vrishabhanu Sute Devi Pranamami Hari Priye Vancha Kalpa Tarubhyascha Kripa Sindhu Bhaevacha Patita Nam Pavani Pyo Vaishnavibhyo Namo Nama Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadhar Shri Vasadi Gaur Bhaktavinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. So we're hearing about the renunciation. What? Okay. So Maharaj Priyavrata 
was uh, brought back to take the throne so that his father Swayambhuvamanu could renounce and go off into Duvanaprastha. But we're hearing <laughs> that although Priyavrata is uh, taking the position of Manu like emperor of the world, the opulence was all, all opulence was available to him, but he was not attracted to it. It did not mean anything to him. All of the opulence of the world had no attraction for him. As Srila Rupaswami describes, Prabhupada quotes Rupa Goswami, he says that the position of a devotee is so super excellent that the devotee has no attraction to any opulence anywhere in the creation, even the opulence of the heavenly planets, which is far, far greater than the opulence of this world. You know, we are here on the earthly planet and we may think sometimes, oh, we may think this is very opulent. You know, maybe we see the new condominiums coming up and we think, oh, they look very opulent. Mm. Or then we, we may see life in a, another country and we may think, oh, it looks so, so clean. You know, sometimes you come to India and it's not so clean, you know, <laughs> a lot of garbage everywhere, <laughs> you know. One of the devotees, one devotee, uh, he, he was not from India, he was from Thailand. And so he got a scholarship to go to Taiwan. So he went to Taiwan, he left Thailand to go to Taiwan and he said, it's so clean here, you know, after being in Thailand. And Thailand's a little cleaner than India. <laughs> a little bit cleaner, not a lot, but <laughs> India still has, you know, especially in the cities we see in Bangalore, sometimes when going around and when I'm going to visit the different centers, so I go in the car and I can see it everywhere quite a bit of garbage there. So they have, they have that problem which they have to, you know, how to remove the garbage. Because you have a lot of people living in a city and people consume. Everyone is consuming so many things, so there's a lot of waste and so on. Anyway, people may come from the countryside and they may think Bangalore is very opulent, you know. Some people think like that. They come from the, the, the rural areas. But uh, opulence is relative. We have opulence in the higher planets, which is far, far greater than we can imagine. And the opulence, there's also opulence in the hellish planets, in Patala Loka. They also have their opulence. It's described that in Patala Loka, it's dark everywhere and all the light comes from jewels. People wear jewels on their head and that way there's light. Even on this planet, there's places like that. There's places where you get six, six months of darkness and six months of light. Some devotees I know in Russia, they told me that, some, that sometimes they go to work in a place in Russia where it's dark for months and months, never see the sun. But they get paid more money to be there, so people <laughs> go there to yet tolerate these kind of inconveniences. Just like Prabhupada went to England, he was in London, and the reporter was asked, asking him, what is it like in hell? And Prabhupada said, this is hell, London. The reporter was surprised. The, rep the reporter, the interviewer being an Englishman, he wasn't aware that he'd been living in hell. But to Prabhupada, coming from Calcutta, Bengal, 
where you see a lot of sunshine, to go to England and see every day cloudy and rainy and wet and windy, just like hell. And Prabhupada told him, <laughs> this is hell. But then he went on, he said, anyway, it's a great credit to you English people, you've built up your country, <laughs> you've built up your civilization here. So hell and heaven and earth, opulences, it's all very relative. And as devotees, we're not very much concerned with these things at all. Just like Maharaj Priyavrata, he was not concerned with opulences. In the Bhagavad Gita, Lord Krishna also warns about the danger of opulence. In Bhagavad Gita, it is stated, Bhogaishwarya prasaktanam thaya parita chetasam vaya vasayatmika buddhi samado na vidyate. In the minds of those who are attached to material opulence and sense gratification, and who are bewildered by such things, then the resolute determination for devotional, for devotional service will not take place. We got a generator? Yeah? Okay. Yeah, the resolute determination for devotional service will not take place if we are bewildered by these things. You know, some people become very, uh, fast, very infatuated by opulence. They're thinking that, oh, it looks so nice. But actually, it's nothing. It is just simply the mind. The mind is bewildered by these things. And you can see how great devotees, they have no interest in this any kind of opulence. Kolaveka Sridhar, for example, is a nice example of a devotee who's really detached, he's indifferent to the opulence of the world. He was living in a very humble abode. His home was broken down almost had holes in the roof, and his cloth was old and ragged, and even his water pot, he had, he didn't have a nice copper water pot, he had an iron water pot. And, you know, this was, so he was living in a very humble, very simple condition. And Lord Chaitanya, at one point, Lord Chaitanya sat on the throne of Vishnu and he revealed himself to be the Supreme Lord. And then he was calling different devotees to come and he wanted them to take some benedictions. And he told the devotees, go and bring Sridhar here. And the devotees were saying, Sridhar? Who's that? They didn't even know who Sridhar was. And Lord Chaitanya had to tell them, you go down there and you see, down there, you see there's a little shack and you probably hear him chanting the holy name when you get near there. So the devotees went there and they found Sridhar and true enough, Sridhar was there, he was chanting the holy name as he always did, practically day and night he would be chanting the holy name. And they brought Sridhar to come and meet Nimai Pandit or Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu as we know him. And Lord Chaitanya asked Sridhar, ask for some blessing, take a benediction from me. What would you like? Would you like a nice kingdom? Do you want wealth? Do you want property? Do you want another wife? Do you want, what, tell me what you want, anything, I can fulfill your desire. But Sridhar said, oh, why? Why I should want anything? He said, the bird is living in his nest and the king is living in his palace. Everyone is enjoying or suffering according to their past activities. 
why I should ask you to change my condition. Whatever income I get, and his income was very meager, he had just a few banana trees and whatever he could get from his banana trees, maybe he would sell the bark or he would sell banana leaves or maybe he got the banana flower, something, somehow he would sell, so he would get a little income and whatever income he got to maintain himself, he would always, without fail, he would spend 50% on the worship of Mother Ganga. Every day he would go to Ganga and worship Mother Ganges and he would spend half of his income in this way. And Lord Chaitanya wanted to give him some blessings, but he said, no, I don't need anything, I'm fine, I have everything I need. And there are many examples like this. Prabhupada describes there was this one uh, spiritual teacher who was living in Bengal and he was living very poor. And this one of his disciples came and wanted to give him some wealth and so that he could live opulently. But the spiritual teacher said, no, no, I don't need your wealth. Whatever rice I get, I get some tamarind leaves and I cook the rice, I'm happy, I don't need anything. I get some green leaves, some sack here and there, that's enough. Why I want to take your wealth? I'm happy. There are many examples of devotees in this way. They're not concerned about their material condition. They can live in any situation of life without being disturbed. Why? Because they're, they have the higher taste. They're experiencing the taste of Krishna consciousness. They're constantly relishing the nectar in loving service to Lord Krishna. So they never think about this lower pleasure, the lower pleasures of life. Uh, we see the example Raghunath Das Goswami, he was born in a family of great wealth. His father and his uncle, his father was at Govardhan Majumdar and Haranya Majumdar, his uncle, they had great wealth. They were maintaining all of the Brahmins in Bengal and Bengal at that time included Bangladesh today. So the whole of Bengal, all the Brahmanas were being maintained by them. They were giving so much charity. And Raghunath was born in that family, but Raghunath didn't like it. He wanted to leave and he ran away. Of course, many times they brought him back, but finally he got free. And he got to Jagannath Puri and he was living there with Lord Chaitanya. Then his father sent wealth. His father sent men and money to him. He thought, I don't want my son to be in any difficulty. I'll send him money, I'll send him servants. They can cook for him, they can take care of him. So Raghunath would arrange a feast for a little while. He would arrange a feast and he would invite all the sannyasis including Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, they would come and he would have a feast served to them. But then he decided enough and he told them, all of you go back and he sent them all back to Bengal. And then Lord Chaitanya asked, what's happening? We're not getting an invitation from Ragnath anymore. So they explained to Lord Chaitanya that, oh, he sent everybody back, he doesn't want us anymore. Lord Chaitanya thought, oh, very good. Then how is he eating now? He said, he gets his food. And Lord Chaitanya said, oh, okay. But then Jagannath Temple and he would beg prasad from the people coming out. But then he stopped doing that. 
And then Lord Chaitanya asked, where did Raghunath go? I don't see him anymore. He's usually standing at the door of the temple begging something, but I don't see him anymore. They said, yes. You know what he does now? He goes to the drains where they wash the different pots and so on, and he collects whatever pieces of rice are there at the drain. And he takes it and he washes it, dries it, and he's eating like that. He's eating whatever he can collect from the drains. And in this way he's maintaining his life. And when Lord Chaitanya heard this, he said, Oh, very nice. And Lord Chaitanya went to find Raghuna and he went, he said, You are feasting and not inviting me. And Lord Chaitanya took some of that food and ate it. So Raghunath, like that, he was very renounced. He was ren now Prabhupada in the purport, he talks that sometimes jnanis and yogis may renounce, but they're not able to maintain the vow of renunciation. They try to give up opulence and they try to renounce but they get some difficulties again they go back to material life and we see sometimes how yogis and so on they renounce the world because according to their philosophy the world is not real they will say Brahman Satyam Jagat Mitya. The world is not real. The world is false. And the saying like that, they go off to the mountains and they go and live in the Himalayas in a cave. But then after some time, they again come back. And again, they will take up some welfare activity. They will open a school they will open a hospital or they will do some, you know, some kind of social activities for the benefit of the people in a mundane way, not spiritual. So initially they had renounced the world, but they're not able to maintain that vow of renunciation because they had not, as Prabhupada explains here, they did not have the higher taste. They just simply had the taste. They renounced, give up everything. But they had no taste of anything superior. And therefore, they were not able to maintain the vow of renunciation. We even see in our Krishna consciousness movement, that sometimes it happens that young men come to our Krishna consciousness movement and they want to renounce, right? They want to renounce. No, I don't want to marry. No, I don't want to work. I don't want... No, I, like this. And when they're, when they're like 20 or 25, they're saying, No, I'm going to be brahmachari, brahmachari, right? And then when they get to 40, they think, mm, uh, maybe I should get married. <laughs> the, the mind, you know, the problems come. And that is one of the, the this uh, happened in Prabhupada's time. In Srila Prabhupada's time, all of the devotees were young. You know, I joined when I was 21. <laughs> so, uh, we were all young people and we had the mood to renounce, you know, because we come to Krishna consciousness. We were really going away from the material world. We didn't want to be part of the materialistic society. We thought, I don't want to be in that rat race, you know, working in the multinational companies, just a rat race. I don't want any part of that kind of life and we would come to Krishna consciousness. So initially we felt quite renounced 
But as time goes on, then you start to consider, you know, how to, how to live and how, how long can you maintain that kind of renunciation. Just like when we were young, we were going out distributing books. And we would go out every day on Harinam Sankirtan and do book distribution. So it's not very many people who can maintain that kind of activity throughout their life. That you have to find some activity which is giving you more uh, engagement, more intellectual engagement. You have to take up some preaching work and, and that, that kind of thing. So not everyone is able to find their place, to find the activity which is suited for that. Some people can do it. Some people, they go in the kitchen and they cook, and they'll cook their whole life, and they're happy to cook for Krishna. And other people will worship the deities, they'll do deity worship their whole life, and they're happy to do that. But not everyone. Sometimes they may be happy doing it initially for some time, but then some point somehow the mind goes and they're not able to remain fixed in that service. Lord Chaitanya chastised Gadarhar Pandit. Gadarhar Pandit had come to Jagannath Puri with Lord Chaitanya. And Gadarhar Pandit took Shetra Sanyas, Shetra Sanyas, meaning he vowed to stay there in Jagannath Puri. But then Lord Chaitanya decided he would go travel in South India and go to Vrindavan and so on. Gadarhar Pandit said, I'm coming with you. But Lord Chaitanya said, no you're not. You're staying here. You took the vow, Shetra Sanyas, and I gave you the deity Tota Gopina. You're supposed to worship Tota Gopina. You cannot give up the worship of Gopinath and you should not break your vow, Shetra Sanyas. Well, Lord Chaitanya didn't like to see devotees give up their service. He liked to see devotees maintain their service. But Sometimes it gets difficult. We know that what, what a person is thinking when they're 20 or 25, when they get to 45, they may be thinking differently. They have a change in thought. So th this is a problem. Unless we get the higher taste, we have to get the higher taste. Yamunacharya, for example, Yamunacharya had been a king. And as a king, as a ruler, he had a kingdom and a palace, and he had so many servants, and he enjoyed all kinds of worldly opulence and pleasures. But then he became a devotee, and he gave it all up. And Srila Prabhupada quotes that verse by Yamunacharya in the Bhagavad Gita. Probably the Brahmacharis know that verse, right? Yadavadi mama chaita Krishna padara vindi nava nava rasa damunyata yantamati tatavari bhatanari sangame smaryamani bhavati mukha nikarasas tu nishti vanamcha. Yamunacharya is saying that previously he had been engaged in all kinds of sense gratification, but now he's experiencing this higher taste because he's engaged in the loving service of Radha and Krishna, and he's remembering all the pastimes of Radha and Krishna. But because he'd engaged in so many material activities in the past, Sometimes his mind would turn back and he would remember what happened when he was a king. 
and then he would remember the different things which happened, how he enjoyed opulence and different kinds of varieties of sense gratification. So he said, when I would remember that, then my lips will curl with distaste and I will spit at the thought. So, this is an example of someone who's got a higher taste. You see that he, he's not regretting that he gave it all up, but rather he's regretting that in the past he'd acted in such a materialistic manner. One devotee came to Prabhupada and he told Prabhupada, he said, when I'm chanting, sometimes my mind will remind me about the different things which I used to do before I became a devotee. The different, you know, all the nonsense things I did as a devotee. And Prabhupada said to him, yes, Krishna is telling you that if you ever give up Krishna, a consciousness, you'll have to go back to that life again. So that's a warning, right? Krishna's warning. If you give up chanting, you go back to that kind of lifestyle again. We have to be very conscious. We want to get this higher taste. How to get this higher taste? Well, we have to increase our hearing and chanting. And we have to give up our attachment to the material world. If we hold on to the material world, if within our mind we're always contemplating sense gratification, then that will be a problem. That will definitely be an obstacle to us experiencing the higher taste. There is a higher taste and it is available for us, but we have to endeavor to get it. We have to desire, we have to want it. And you have to want it intensely. Just like to get love of God, you have to want it. You have to have that intense greed to achieve it. They use the word low young. Mm. The, and it said, Prabhupada quotes the verse, uh, there's only one price to pay to achieve this higher taste, this supreme pleasure. The price is the intense desire or the greed to achieve it. You know, just like they say, only one price, right? Fixed price. Usually we go, we bargain. Come say, come, kitna rupiah chaye. Right? We, we say like that, we want lower price. But Krishna consciousness, you want to get this higher taste? Only one price. Hmm? And the, that price, intense greed to get it. If you don't have that greed, then you won't get it. We have to really want it very badly. You want it so much that you cry to get it. I was remembering when I used to make life members in Calcutta, there was this one life member we had, he used to come to our temple and he would often say to me, he said, I can cry for my wife. I can cry for my children, I can cry for my business, but I cannot cry for Krishna. So this is a very uh, honest expression of his condition. But this is not the condition you want if you want to get this higher taste. We have to really want to get this taste and we will pay, we'll do anything we can to get it. We're ready to give up everything. And you see the example of Bali Maharaj. Bali Maharaj is a good example of giving up everything. Of course, he didn't really give it up 
Lord Vamanadev took it from him. He took everything away from him, but he didn't mind. He tolerated it. And even Lord Vamanadev saying, you're, you're suppo you were dishonest, you lied to me, you told me three steps. Where am I supposed to take the third step? And then he said, you take it on my head. And so that was the glory of bow. Of course, we don't have to give up everything, but don't be attached to it. That is the point. If you're attached to it, if you're bewildered by it, then it's not good. We have to recognize it's all Krishna's. Krishna gives. Krishna gives and Krishna takes. So if Krishna takes from you, why lament? Krishna gave you. Prabhupada said, God has ten hands. With ten hands, if he wants, he can give you so much and he can also take so much. We should surrender to Krishna. What does Krishna want? We're just his servant. He may give, he may take. Don't be attached to the opulence. Be attached to service. That is the point. We want to become fixed in service to Krishna. That we can serve Krishna in any condition, with opulence or without opulence. Prabhupada could go to America. He didn't even have Medanga. I don't know if he even had cartels, I don't know. But he would go in the park and he would chant. And he didn't have big books. They had a little, you know, he printed a little Back to Godhead, Gestetner style, you know, it was run off on a Gestetner machine. Very simple. But Prabhupada's not complaining. He's happy. It's his service. We don't consider the material conditions. Devotee should not be disturbed. Whatever condition Krishna places us in, our business is the same. Right? Narayana parasarve nakutas chinyavibhyate swarga apavarga narakesh vapito yatadarshana. Devotee of Krishna doesn't see any difference between heaven and hell and liberation. Wherever he goes, the business is the same. Chanting Hare Krishna, preaching Krishna consciousness. There's no difference. You're here in Los you're here in Bangalore, or you go to Los Angeles or you go to Mayapur, or you go to Badrik Ashram, Badri Ash, Badrik Ashram, wherever you go, business is the same. You chant Hare Krishna, preach Krishna consciousness. No difference. So we have to develop that kind of consciousness. Don't be considering opulence or the, the Sesh Adripuram, I've got this big building, oh, so opulent, oh, a big temple. Uh. No, it's all the same. The business, the activities are the same. You sit under a tree or you're in the big palace. Does it make any difference to the devotee? No difference. Prabhupada went to Hong Kong, devotee arranged five-star hotel for him. So Prabhupada was in this big, it, the hotel was owned by an Indian man actually, so they, they, he gave the penthouse suite for Prabhupada. And so he gave also his Rolls Royce car to bring Prabhupada from the airport. So reporters came to meet Prabhupada and they said, Oh Swamiji, we saw you come in the Rolls Royce and now you're living in the penthouse suite in this five-star hotel. And Prabhupada... <laughs> Hare Krishna censored. Huh? <laughs> 
Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Okay, bye. <laughs> Prabhupada said to the reporters, if I was to sit under a tree, you would not come to see me. <laughs> but because I'm in the hotel and I came in the Rolls Royce, so you're all here today. Yes. But no different. For Prabhupada, there's no difference. The reporters, they saw a difference. But Prabhupada's not thinking any different. His business is the same. Tell them about Krishna. And similarly, in London, in London, in 1971, I remember these reporters came, and at, at that time, at that time, there was a lot of publicity about gurus from India. And there was that one man in Pune, he'd gone to America, and he had a big fleet of very expensive motor cars in his community which he'd made over in America or Canada, I can't remember. Anyway, he'd run out of Pune to avoid the tax and he'd gone off to America and he had a big fleet of motor cars and then there was other people, different gurus who were very opulent. And then Prabhupada came to London and Prabhupada's living with us in our little rented house in London. And Prabhupada was living with us and the, of course people in London know that we were going every day in the street and doing Harinam Sankirtan. And they would see us regularly distributing our little magazine for a few coins. And so the reporters came to ask Prabhupada that, what do you think of all these gurus having all of these big cars? And Prabhupada said, well, the one on the bicycle may be a cheater. You cannot judge who is the bona fide guru just by the vehicle which they ride in. The person riding the bicycle may be a bigger cheater than the man in the motor car. You cannot judge by material circumstances. So Prabhupada didn't, he didn't criticize them, but he was educating the newspaper reporters, he wanted them to understand the principle that the spiritual teacher is not understood by how many cars he's got. It, and similarly, it doesn't matter how many disciples they have. That's not how you judge who is the most advanced, the most elevated spiritual teacher. You have to hear from them. Hearing is the important principle. You hear from them and then you can understand what is actually their position. So that is the real business of devotees. Our business is to speak, right? To tell people about Krishna. Opulence, mystic powers, all of these things, not very important for devotees. Then when they would ask Prabhupada about mystic powers, Prabhupada would point to all the devotees and say, this is my mystic power. That all of these people, they were all meat eaters and uh, typical materialistic people. And now they're completely devoted to Krishna and they're in love of God. He said, so that is my mystic power, that I could change them. So that is a great opulence, to be able to change someone, to bring them out of material life, to get them to give up the path of sense gratification and give them Krishna consciousness. Okay, are there any questions? Anyone?
Can you hold it up to your mouth? Well, you have to get to control over your mind, right? Your mind is here and there. You know that's a problem. So, you, you stay here. You have to make a vow. You see, you have to be determined that you want something. If your mind is here and there, it means you're not very fixed in what you want. You have to be more focused that you want to become Krishna conscious, you want to become a devotee. You don't want to go back to that material world, into that material world, the jungle, the forest of materialistic living. You have to be convinced that Krishna consciousness is a better life. A better life. Now, you. Generally, you know, like we, we, we can reflect maybe on past experience before becoming a devotee. Just like there was one devotee, one disciple of Srila Prabhupada, he was from a, wealth, a wealthy American family. His father was a lawyer and he had his own office in America and his son, had become a devotee and he'd come to India with Prabhupada in 1971 or like that, very in the beginning of the India preaching. He'd come to India. So his father came to India and he came to see Prabhupada and he said to Prabhupada, All right, Swamiji, how much do I have to pay you to get my son back? So Prabhupada said, Bring the, that was Giriraj actually, Giriraj Swami now, Giriraj. So he said, bring Giriraj here. And so Giriraj came into the room where Prabhupada was sitting with his Giriraj's father. And so Prabhupada said to Giriraj, your father wants you to go back with him to America. Your father said he has a business and you're supposed to take the company and be the main man in the company. He needs you to go back. And Giri Raj said, I won't go Prabhupada. I'm not going to go. Why? And Prabhupada said, why? He said, my mother and father, they always fight and argue with each other. My sister, she's just she just uh, has so many boyfriends and she, you know, the way she lives. But he said, I can't go back to that life again. And so Prabhupada turned to his father and said, he doesn't want to go. What can I do? <laughs> so when you are convinced that this is a better life, then you can really go forward in Krishna Consciousness. You, you have to understand what is Krishna, what is Krishna Consciousness? What, what is this life of Krishna Consciousness? It's a life away from sinful life. We're giving up all sinful life, right? No, no intoxication, no gambling, no illicit sex, no meat, fish and eggs, these things. And 
waking up early in the morning, coming to temple, doing these things. It's a very different way of living from a lot of people, materialistic people. They're all thinking how to make money, how to get rich. And the devotees thinking how to get bhakti, how to get devotion, how I can get love of Krishna. We're not thinking about God, we're not thinking about money, we're thinking about Krishna. So you have to consider where, what kind of life do you want? Do you really think the material world can give you a better life? People work so hard to get money, are they happy? Even if they get money, not everyone gets money, of course. But some people have that karma, they can make money easily. So if you have that karma, you'll get it as a devotee anyway. You don't have to give up being Krishna conscious. If you're meant to be rich, even as a devotee you'll be rich. But you'll be a devotee. But if you go to the material world, you become rich. Does it mean you'll be happy? You still have the material world, the, the rat race, the envy, the competition. It's not a very pleasant world. I don't know why you would want to go back into the material world. We have to be convinced that there's something more, something special in Krishna consciousness that you never want to give it up, whatever happens. Yeah. Well, we have many devotees also in the corporate world. You know, it's not that because you're in the corporate world you cannot be a devotee. There are many people who are also working in the corporate world, but they're devotees. You just have to, you have to do the sadhana, just like, you know, we do. The people working in the corporate world, they also do. They will wake up early and they will chant Hare Krishna and worship Krishna before they go into the corporate world. And they understand the corporate world is not eternal. You know, it's not like birth after birth you'll be in the corporate world. You have to understand it's very temporary. How long the corporate world will exist, we don't know. And what is your position in the corporate world? How long do you, are you guaranteed a job there? You know, markets change, technology changes. We, you know, 20 years ago there was no corporate world. Now you're talking corporate world. In 20 years' time, where will you be? We don't know. So, you have to go with the flow, right? <laughs> the, the, the job market changes, you move out the corporate world, you find some other job. But Krishna consciousness, that is sanatana dharma. That is the eternal occupation. Not of the body, but of the soul. 
The corporate world, that's engaging your mind and intelligence, your material brain. But Sanatan Dharma, Krishna consciousness is for the soul. It's eternally benefit. Whatever you do in the corporate world, that's your karma. You're enjoying your karma. By your good karma, you got in the corporate world. How long your good karma will last? We don't know. But Krishna consciousness doesn't depend on karma. It's nothing to do with karma. Krishna consciousness is transcendental. And whatever advancement you make, you'll never lose that. Whatever progress you make in the corporate world, it can be finished with the body. Next life, you don't, doesn't matter. You were in the corporate world last life. Where were you in your last life? You don't know. Now, you know, where are you going to be the next life? So, we should be thinking about our soul, our spiritual position. We're all eternal spiritual beings. Where are we going to be? We want, ideally, we want to get out of this world of birth and death. You know, there were so many people in the Twin Towers, you know, in New York, when, you know, they were also working in the corporate world, you know, where are they now? Yeah. I don't know what happened to them, but that's the kind of destiny, but these kind of things happen. But if you're in Krishna consciousness, then you're secure, birth after birth. Whatever progress you've made, you'll never lose it. It got your material bank account, you know, sometimes you make money, sometimes you lose it. But in Krishna consciousness, it's all going up, never, never reduces. The more you do service for Krishna, the more you hear and chant, your spiritual bank account will increase more and more. And that's what will make the difference to help you go back to Godhead, to get out of this world, or at least to give you a better life in the future. You know, there, there, Bhagavad Gita Krishna describes that someone may have practiced yoga, he didn't practice very long, the next life they will take birth in a wealthy family, an aristocratic family and they have the chance again to continue. And someone made a lot of advancement, but still not perfect. They will be born in the family of devotees. And in the family of devotees, then from childhood, they have the opportunity to take Krishna consciousness. So that's very rare to get that kind of birth. So you do get great benefit by practicing Krishna consciousness. But what do you get from the corporate world? You get a lot of pressure, a lot of headaches. <laughs> you get a lot of anxiety. You get some money also, of course, but you know, <laughs> money's not everything. Okay? No, wait. Hare Krishna. Thank you, Mr. Class. So you mentioned in class that, that only time you have to pay is our interest rate to get the to get Krishna pay, interest rate to Krishna pay. So intellectually I understand that this is a question of the question in mind that that he is not there for Krishna of the I I didn't catch it. What did uh, Yeah I uh, uh, question is that Intellectually, I understand that you have to be anxious and greedy for Krishna, but uh, although I just understand at the level of the head or in the mind, but I am not able to practice it. <laughs> it to practice. So why or what should I do? What should you do? You come here every day. You come here and practice. You need association. 
Right? You want to practice, you, you do it here without thinking about it, you practice, you see. Every day we hear and chant, every day we see the deities, worship Krishna, worship Krishna's pure devotees. So, if you just keep coming here, very naturally you awaken that, that love, that greed, association. Krishna Consciousness property, 98% association. So you just keep coming here regularly and no problem, you'll get that greed. Yeah. Yes? Yes? How to become fixed in service to Krishna? We have to, well, we have to give up all of our material desires. The, because why are we not fixed in Krishna consciousness? Because of the flickerings of the mind. As the young lady said, mind is here and there, the mind wanders here. And this is due to our attachments and material desires which we have. Somehow we have to learn to control the mind. Controlling the mind, it's, it's really the focus, right? You have to make the mind the friend. Is your mind a friend or is it your enemy? Do you know when your mind is being a friend? And do you know when your mind is being your enemy? We have to recognize when the mind is the enemy. So the mind, we say, like a wild animal. To train the wild animal, you have to, when they capture the lion, they put it in the cage and they starve it and then they beat it and then they feed it. So the, the lion thinks, this man is very powerful, put me in the cage, kept me in the cage for many days, no food, I was very hungry and then he beat me and now he's feeding me. So I have to do what he says. So we have to deal with our mind like that. You have to beat the mind, starve the mind. First of all, starve it and then beat it and then feed it, right? So how do we starve the mind? You neglect the mind. When the mind says, oh, don't go to the temple, oh, don't chant, oh, don't do... Don't listen to the mind, right? Just neglect the mind. The mind says, let's go to party, let's go to bar, let's eat this. Neglect the mind, just neglect the mind. Don't listen to the mind. The mind will always tell us so many things. Go to cinema, oh no, no. You have to, we have to just learn to discipline the mind and then Beat the mind. How do you beat the mind? You make it do what it doesn't want to do, right? The mind doesn't want to chant, you chant. The mind doesn't want to go to temple, you go to temple. You have to, we have to just learn how to control the mind, how to make the mind obedient for our spiritual benefit. So training the mind, very important, because the very first thing in devotional service to fix the mind on Krishna. And Prabhupada said, everything depends on the attitude. Our attitude has to be right. So we have to want to become a devotee. We have to want to become Krishna conscious. That's very important. If we think, oh, it doesn't matter, I'll be Krishna conscious next lifetime. No guarantee. 
We don't know what's going to happen, Kali Yuga. So take advantage. Okay, Hare Krishna, Srila Prabhupada ki, Srimad Bhagavatam ki, Gaur Pramanande. Vishnu, I think, is the man who 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 is the man